There was a husband and wife who went to see their doctor. The husband hadn't been feeling very well, and so the doctor ran a battery of tests on him to figure it out. He brought the couple back into his office, and they sat down. And the doctor began to explain to the husband that he had a very serious illness. And then, unfortunately, there was nothing, medically speaking, that could be done for him. And so he was going to die. Well, after a few sober moments, the couple began to collect their belongings and make their way to the exit. And just as they were approaching the door, the doctor asked to speak with the wife for just a moment longer. And uh, the husband proceeded to go on out to the car. And the doctor looked at the wife and explained that although there was nothing medically speaking that could be done for her husband, and although he didn't want to say this in front of her husband, that if she were to uh, make him three square meals a day and make passionate love to him every night, her husband would live. Well, the wife thanked the doctor for the information, and, and she went on back out to the car. And when she got to the car, the husband naturally asked her, what did the doctor say? And she turned to her hu husband, and without hesitation, she said, you're going to die. <laughs> Listen, this morning, we're going to take a deep dive into a disease that's killing you and me. This is a disease though, that no amount of comfort can cure, no amount of medical treatment can address. We're going to be taking a very long walk down a dark hallway to address the issue of sin. And to be clear, this is an issue we need to look at. Uh, I joked with people all week long uh, that that I'd finally been given a topic that I was qualified to address. Um, but it, 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 truthfully, it would be a mistake for us to think that way, to think that our extensive experience in the area of sin has made us an expert. It hasn't. It's kind of like our smartphones. I, I may seem like an expert at using my smartphone, but I have no idea how it actually works. It's similar with sin. Also, though sin is prevalent and personal and practiced, that doesn't mean we understand it. And to think otherwise would actually be a deadly mistake. A deadly mistake. And in real life, it is difficult for us to practically have a grasp on our sin because the MO for sin is to stay hidden. Sin wants to stay in the shadows. Sin is seductive, it's destructive but it is incredibly deceptive. That's why we need to pay attention to understanding this issue. And so this morning, we're going to pursue a deeper understanding of sin, and we're going to see and unmask the corresponding lies that it likes to hide behind. And we're going to be doing that by looking at the reality of sin, the severity of sin, and the consequences of sin. The reality of sin, the severity of sin, and the consequences of sin. And actually, you know, if you're someone in here this morning who maybe, you know, you're not really that much into this Jesus thing, or you don't know about this whole church thing, uh, you know, and you have some questions there, I actually want to encourage you in particular to pay attention to this first point uh, when we address the issue of the reality of sin. It's an important starting point because the first thing that we all need to do is in addressing this kind of an issue is actually just to establish its existence. And so I want to look at one of the foundational texts on sin, which is Genesis chapter 3. Go ahead and turn there with me. This is an account of how sin entered the world. It's a look at creation, the creation story, Adam and Eve, the tree that they're not supposed to eat from, that whole thing. All right, this is that story. Genesis chapter 3. Take a look at it with me. Verse 1 says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God has made. All right, that's why it gets selected here. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? I'll pause there for a second. Take a note of what's going on. What is it that is being planted in Eve's mind? Confusion. 
Confusion. Confusion is the first thing out of the gate. The very first sin was employing confusion. The first sin was wearing a mask. And note, what else happens in this text is not that he's just inviting Eve to question God. Did God really say that? But he's also moving further from it. See, in reality, what we would call moral relativism, okay, the idea that right and wrong are just subjective, that's nothing new. That's nothing new that's been present in one form or another since the garden. Confusion over what God has been saying since the beginning is happening. And it's not just happening as the serpent is inviting Eve to question what God has said. He is also subtly twisting God's words. If you know the story well, you know what you know, God had actually commanded, which was a prohibition against one tree, but the snake twists it to a prohibition against, did you catch the word? Any tree. It's subtle. It's confusion over sin. It's a mask. Verse 2, the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, the, the sneaky snake, as my kids like to call him, uh, he only speaks twice here, right? He only speaks twice. First, with confusion and twisting the words. Second, is with an outright lie and the greatest bait of all time. You'll be like God. You will have the answers. Your curiosity will be satisfied. You will know for yourself what's right and what's wrong. You'll be making that decision. And you can see that that's what's going on because Eve is hooked. Verse 6 gives us a glimpse into her thoughts. It says, so when the woman saw that the tree was good, right there actually, she's stepping into God's role. It has been God's role throughout the first two chapters to define what is good. God has been the one pronouncing what is good, and now Eve is deciding for herself, I'm going to step into that role. I'm going to decide what's good for me. And what led to that conclusion, the woman saw, first the tree was good for food. It's a practical lure. And she saw it was a delight to her eyes. There's an aesthetic lure. And that the tree was desired to make one wise. There's a power lure. And so she took of its fruit, and she ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with, as in right there with her, and he ate. Now, when you think about the reality of sin, we need to see the, the two pieces that are in play here in this passage. First, God has established for us the reality of what is sin. We haven't. That's very important. We saw that in the text. God defines the standards for us. We don't set those. And anything that does not meet those standards is sin. From the beginning, sin existed as God defined it. How is it defined for, for us? Well, we can see in places, as we look at all of Scripture, 1 John 3, 4, which very succinctly defines it for us, saying sin is lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. I appreciate how the, the New City Catechism defines this. It says sin is rejecting or ignoring God in the world he created not being or doing what he requires in his law. That was the case for Adam and Eve then, and it is the case for us today. God has spoken, and he has established the standards for what sin is in his creation. So if that's the reality of sin, what is the mask? What are we saying is the mask? Sin challenges this very simple reality by using confusion to mask its very existence. Confusion is the first mask we need to pull back. The same seeds of doubt, of confusion, of lies that were employed with the first sin are being employed with sin today. And we can see the confusion over right and wrong all over the place, right? We can see it all over the place. And it's causing all kinds of crises for our culture. And no one, Christian or not, is exempt from having to deal with it. 
I think one of the most subtle evidences of this mask when it comes to the confusion is the way that we have just dropped the word sin from our vocabulary altogether. Have you noticed that? We don't use that word anymore. It's archaic to us. Instead, when we talk about somebody making a wrong moral decision, we will describe it as something where they made an error in judgment, right? Or it just happened as if it magically, you know, things just happen, right? Or we even move beyond that, we'll, we'll write it off as a disease, right? We have terms like narcissism. <laughs> we just write things off as a disease, leave it there. Or my favorite, we'll call it a mistake, just a mistake. As one author wrote about this, and I think he puts it so well, he said, there is a problem with using the term mistake to describe all of our less than perfect decisions and behaviors. The problem is that the label doesn't describe everything we call a mistake. A mistake is an error in action, calculation, opinion, or judgment caused by poor reasoning, carelessness, or insufficient knowledge. Mistakes are accidental. A mistake is something a sixth grader makes on a math test. However, we have expanded that definition to include just about everything. Sometimes we make mistakes on purpose, don't we? Don't you? Sometimes we plan our mistakes. Think about that. You're guilty of premeditated mistakes. What do you call a mistake you make on purpose? Perhaps we've made a mistake, substituting the term mistake for all things less than perfect. Perhaps we need a new term. Perhaps we should reach back and resurrect an old term. As uncomfortable and as old school as the term sin may seem, there's a benefit to reintroducing the word into our vocabularies. Are you beginning to see the edges of this mask? Confusion over sin's very existence in the way we talk and in the way we think about what is right and what is wrong is the first mask that we need to pull back, that we need to pull down. Doing something that's wrong, that ignores or breaks God's commands is sin, period. It's not a mistake. It's wrong. It's not an error. It's evil. Don't underestimate, though, this lie. Don't underestimate it. The lie of confusion has no boundaries. No boundaries whatsoever. Isaiah 5.20 reminds us, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Put, who put darkness for light, light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet, and sweet for bitter. There is no boundaries to this confusion, all the way to the point of calling something good evil. There's no boundaries. So let me be abundantly clear on this issue. If that's the case, maybe there's still part of though our hearts that wants to defend this reality of sin, I want to point out, unless it's the case that sin is ignoring God and his commands in the world, unless that exists, there is no reason that anything is actually right or wrong. There's no reason that anything else should actually be right or anything else should actually be wrong. If sin doesn't exist, racism or rape isn't wrong. It's just something you might not like. Because you cannot speak about something being wrong without appealing to a higher standard than simply your preference. You can't do it. There is no reason that something should actually be right or something should actually be wrong unless God has actually spoken. Unless sin is real. There's no reason whatsoever. Now that scenario, in the reality of sin, I think is one that many of us were perfectly comfortable with, right? We're perfectly comfortable admitting that and, and living in that reality. The issue follows, though, when it gets too close to what we're doing, when it gets too close to us and our lives. This is where the next mass begins to come into play because inevitably the reality of sin leads us to being faced with the severity the severity of sin. If sin is exposed for being present, the natural next question is, how extensive is it? If you found out you had a disease, you would naturally want to know, how bad is it? Right? How bad is it? The, if the first mask of sin is undone, it moves to the second mask. It's got plenty more. The second mask is a lie that I think, though, is far more subtle and far more seductive than we give it credit for. 
The second mass deals with our severity. It says, my sin, it, it's not really bad. It's bad, but it's not that bad. But when we talk or we think that way, what we're doing is we are putting ourselves back into the driver's seat. We are like a student that admits that the teacher should be allowed to set the standards, but we still plan on doing the grading ourselves, right? That's what's happening here. This is a very subtle movement from the denial of sin to the excusing of sin. That's what's at the heart of the second mask. It's about excusing. The first lie operated like a smoke bomb of confusion. The second operates like a sliding scale, okay? Again, you can see literal examples of this throughout our culture in the way that we talk. We will say things like, well, I'm not perfect, right? I'm not perfect. We will admit that we didn't meet the standard, but we give this illusion like we were somewhere in the vicinity of perfection, right? We still like to pretend. Like even though we didn't meet it, it wasn't real far off. There are a myriad of versions to this lie with the subtle attempts to excuse sin. We see this in the first version of this lie. Genesis chapter 3, we see this in this account as well. After Adam and Eve sin, they hide in the trees. God comes looking for them. He says in verse 9, But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? Right? Omniscient God, gently coming. Asking a question. He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Then he, God, said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree I, of which I commanded you not to eat? Here it is. The man said to the woman, said, the woman whom you gave to me, she gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate. Then the Lord said to the woman, what is it that you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. Some of you may know the, the old joke. Adam blamed Eve. Eve blamed the snake. And the snake didn't have a leg to stand on. <laughs> Friends, I know, it's horrible. Uh, <laughs> Friends, you can't miss, though, this passage. The attempt to excuse. The attempt to blame. Nothing has changed. These same kinds of excuses about sin and how bad my sin is really continues today, easily. And we need to pull down this mask. To do that, though, we have to see the depths. We have to see the severity of our sin. And that happens as we allow God to do the grading. And that's precisely what he proceeds to do, by the way, with Adam and Eve. We need this done, too. We need God to show us the severity of our sin, and that happens as the one who sets the standards shows us how we missed the standards. For example, Romans chapter 1. It's a foundational text on sin. God describes sin here in this passage. Verse 18 of the chapter opens up with this. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness. Same definition we looked at with sin at the beginning. Ignoring God and his commands. Who, by their unrighteousness, their sin, suppress the truth. Right? Sin tries to hide. It's, it's trying to, to prop up these lies. Verse 19 to 23 then goes on to describe the extent of the lies. And verses 24 to 27 describes the extensive fallout from the sin. And then listen, though, to how sin gets described here in verse 28. Listen to this. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossips, slanders, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree and those who practice such things deserve to die they not only do them but give approval to those who practice them let me ask you does that at all sound like the way you and i describe our sin i don't think so not in the least do we take our sin that seriously 
Do we see it as being that deep, as being that severe? I don't think so. But God does. God does. See, as uncomfortable as it is, we need to understand the depth of our sin. Not just that we have it, but how bad it is, how deep it is, how severe it is, really. And this passage, as you think about that question, of how bad is it really? This passage and others would point out three kinds of sin that show us, I think, just how bad it is. First of all, we see sins of omission. There are things that God has told us to do that we have not done. There are things of commission, sins of commission, where God has said, don't do this, and we did it. We're guilty of those too. Finally, are sins of ignorance. And do we realize at times, I think this is kind of like the forgotten one, our sin actually runs so deep, it is so pervasive, that we can sin without even realizing it. We can sin without even fully recognizing it. That's how deep our sin is. And Christian or not, we will either own this or we will continue to try to excuse this. But let me be abundantly clear with this issue again. If we don't recognize the severity of our sin, instead, if we first try to just excuse it, it will only get worse. It will only get worse. And the first casualty of excusing sin is forgiveness. You want to know if if this is a struggle for you, this second mask, forgiveness. Is it prevalent in your life? Is it prevalent in your home, your relationship with others? Forgiveness is the first casualty of sin that is being excused. Author, Professor C.S. Lewis, he explained this far better than I ever could. He, He wrote this. It's a bit long, but it is totally worth it. He said, now it seems to me that we often make the mistake both about God's forgiveness of our sins and about the forgiveness we are told to offer other, for other people's sins. Take it first about God's forgiveness. I find that when I th- think I am asking God to forgive me, I am often, in reality, unless I watch myself very closely, asking him to do something quite different. I'm asking him not to forgive me, but to excuse me. But there's all the difference in the world between forgiving and excusing. Forgiveness says, you've done this wrong, this thing, but I accept your apology. I will never hold it against you, and everything between us will be exactly as it was before. But excusing says, I see that you couldn't help it, or didn't mean it. You weren't really to blame. If one was not really to blame, then there's nothing to forgive. In that sense, forgiving and excusing are almost opposites. Of course, in dozens of cases, either between God and man, or between man and another, there may be a mixture of the two. Part of what seemed at first to be the sins turned out to really be nobody's fault and is excused. The bit that's left over is forgiven. If you had a perfect excuse, you would not need forgiveness. And if the whole of your actions needs forgiveness, then there is no excuse for it. We must be careful to never excuse the sin that must be forgiven. The reality and the severity of your sin and mine demands nothing less. Nothing. So friends, if we're recognizing the state of affairs here, that the reality and the severity of our sin in direct opposition to the confusion and excusing the attempts to mask it, if we're recognizing this, we need to go to the next aspect. Where do we really stand in God's doctor's office? We need to follow this grim diagnosis all the way to the final question of what will happen as a result. What are the consequences of sin? Consequences of sin. When we consider the consequences of sin, as we saw in Genesis 3, the consequence is death. But you might not think of that correctly. Death here is really is an umbrella term. Because as you look at it closely, it wasn't simply death as in cessation. Right? As, the, the, as in physical death, but it was in separation. Not just cessation, but separation. In Genesis 3, we see that sin didn't simply result in physical death, but it resulted in much more. It resulted in, in a rift internally with ourself, externally with others and with creation, and a rift spiritually between us and God. 
And this rift, as we see throughout Scripture, has both legal aspects and relational aspects. It has consequences in both of those areas. And this doesn't just happen currently on earth, but we're told that this happens forever. That this is an eternal aspect as well. That we are separated in the second death from God in hell. And that although we are oftentimes far more distressed about our present consequences, Jesus was abundantly clear about which consequence we should be the most concerned about. He said in Matthew 10, 28, And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot f- kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both body and soul in hell. Destroy here. It has a sense, as it does elsewhere in Scripture, of ruin. Like a city that's been destroyed or your health that has been destroyed by cancer. The second death has an unending destruction. The consequences of sin then are deadly serious. So the mask the sin employs here is one that is very simple but very bitter. It's a mask of despair. Despair. It's a lie that says there's no hope. This is such an insidious lie because it's mixed with just a little bit of truth. See, because if we are struck by the hideous reality of our sin and we recognize its severity, that it has pervaded every thought, every word, every action in ways that I have failed to do what is right, in ways that I I, I do what is wrong, what uh, God has said not to do, and it's so pervasive that I can even sin without fully realizing it. If it's that pervasive and I see the consequences of its ruination in my life and I think about the ruin that is ahead of me, well, I can despair at the realization that there is nothing I can do to fix it, which is true, which is true. Think of it this way. When my son Judah was one year old, one year, one year old, I had the husbandly job of feeding him Okay, and uh, so I had that bowl with the orange mixture of carrots and stuff that's been pureed, and I had the spoon, and he sits up there in his high chair and laughs at me, and, uh, and I, I'm, as I'm spooning, you know, this mixture on in, he suddenly, I'm a new dad, I, I hadn't learned my lessons yet, but he suddenly reaches out his hand and he grabs that bowl, <laughs> and you know what happened next. He pulled, and I pulled, and the bowl went everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> the mixture exploded as he let go. <laughs> and it covered me, it covered him, it covered the floor, it covered the walls, and it was that textured wall, you know, with all those indentations. We were cleaning that orange stuff up till the day we moved out of that house. I think the next people were still cleaning that wall. That moment, Judah could do nothing to clean it up. That's sin. That's where we're stuck. We are stuck in something that has utterly pervaded every aspect of our lives. We are stuck in something that is so severe and it has consequences now and into the future. And we despair at the state because there is nothing that we can do to fix it. Believing falsely, though, that there is no hope. This is where we unmask the lie. That although you and I are great sinners, that sin has tainted our very life in every single regard, and we are worthy of every kind of label that you can probably come up with, of liar, thief, racist, promiscuous, whatever, we we probably fit the bill. That likely you and I are fully deserving of it. That although I am a great sinner, in spite of it all, Christ is an even greater Savior. Christ is an even greater Savior. You and I can have hope that although we just melt at the face of sin and seeing its reality in our world and we we wither when we listen to Scripture passages describing our sin and we cry at the consequences that we see being played out in the lives of others and in our own life and in our culture, we cry at all of those things. We have this hope. That in spite of all the consequences, when we turn and we look at the cross and we see the mercy and grace that was poured out through Jesus, we have hope. 
that he who bore the wrath and paid the price for our sin and for anyone who's willing to turn to him can have a hope that when this last mask comes off, the cross becomes precious. Becomes precious. And we see that it was absolutely nothing of my own doing, (laughs) but it was only by the sheer grace of God that I'm saved. And that you can be saved too. Only by your sheer grace. Friends, the more that you and I see and understand our own sin and unmask its lies, the more that we appreciate God's holiness and the true costliness of his grace. And there's there's the only way that we enter in. We realize it is only by his grace that we enter in to some kind of right standing with the holy God who set the standards that I broke And we realize it it only makes sense that by repenting and trusting in somebody else who did it perfectly and paid the price on our behalf that I can have an advocate that pleads with me before Almighty God and can give me a covering so that I can walk into his presence, so I can enter heaven. And if you haven't done the work of repenting, that's your starting point this morning. That's your starting point. As God opens up your heart to faith, we repent. That's our starting point. But if you're someone who has that covering, who has received God's grace, and you want to live live differently in your life now as a result of what he's done in you and for you, then this morning I want to give you a practice that helps you, helps me, can help us keep from the confusion, the excusing, and the despairing over the consequences of sin. And this is a practice called mortification. Now, I have no idea what comes into your mind when you hear the word mortification. But let me tell you what should come into your mind. Romans 8, 13. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Paul here is addressing those who are already saved and he's instructing them to mortify, to kill the misdeeds, the sin of the body with the help of the Holy Spirit to have life. John Owen, a Puritan from a long time ago, once said, be killing sin or it will be killing you. So how do we do that? How do we do that well? In some ways, when we look at the sermon, this has been an exercise in that regard. In fact, as then as we conclude, we move to communion. It's an exercise in that regard further. In mortification, we are attempting to look beyond the masks of sin that has been besetting in our life. We're attempting to look beyond the mask and really not even just look at the deeds, at the actions, but we're looking even more so just at the desire. What is it that, what is the idol that is driving this in my life? Is it an idol of control, of comfort, of significance? What is it about this sin, this particular way of thinking or doing or talking that just seems to keep on getting a hold of me? And as we look at that and we see this and we describe that, then we turn and we look at the holiness of Jesus. We look at God's holiness. We look at the beauty and the goodness and the truth of the gospel. And as we're doing that, what we're doing is we are killing our love for this thing that is wrong, and we are attempting to replace and grow it with our love that is right. For what is right? This is the spiritual discipline of mortification. And we can't do it without the help of the Holy Spirit. We need his help in seeing our sin, seeing the idol that's driving this, seeing how it is affecting us. And then us, who are recipients of God's grace through Jesus Christ, in that we are recognizing the reality of our sin. And then we turn and we look to the cross, the beautiful holiness of God for hope, for grace, and for truth. That sets us free from sin. Let's engage in that together now through prayer and communion. Would you bow your heads with me? Father, we recognize that to do the work of mortification, we need courage. 
God, this is the last thing that any of us wants to walk towards and to look at and to think about with any amount of effort, but it is precisely what you have called us to do before we come and participate in the communion experience before we come to your table. And so, God, we also, though, in this, we recognize that not only the the desire, the courage to be able to do this is needed, we also need your help in the examination. We need you to do the grading on our heart and to ask that. For that, we need your Holy Spirit to come to search our hearts. As the psalmist wrote, to search me, God, and know my heart, test me, and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. So God, we ask that right now that the Holy Spirit would work and reveal and show what it is that we have been excusing. What it is that we have been ignoring. Where it is that we have continued to come up short in. We ask God that this sin would be revealed, recognize that we would recognize the idol, what's driving it. And God, we want to not only ask that you would service that, but we ask that we wouldn't ignore what you're pointing out. That we would confess it, that we would have the courage to call it for what it is, that we wouldn't excuse it any longer, but that we would repent in the sure and certain hope of Jesus, our great Savior, that we would recognize his work on the cross, that we would see your gospel, that we would see all the beauty of what it offers a life, that we recognize that you have done something amazing for us, and that your grace has now offered us a new kind of life. We pray that we would celebrate that we would fix our eyes on it. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.